Spring Boot is a huge framework. It has this vast ecosystem and a lot of options, which is great in general, but can sometimes feel like a confusing mess, even to experienced developers. There are often like multiple ways of doing something and sometimes too much of magic behind the scenes makes it very easy for you to make mistakes, right? Other developers, I mean, I never make mistakes. We have to be thoughtful in how we leverage the framework. You might be thinking you're doing things the spring way only to discover that there are better alternatives which exist, right? In this video, I'll shine a light on common pitfalls in Spring Boot and how you can avoid falling into these traps. Doesn't matter if you're just getting started or you have some experience already, these tips will help you build Spring Boot applications the right way. Kicking off our list of mistakes is the one that I've seen way too often, overusing annotations in Spring Boot. Now, annotations are incredibly powerful in Spring and basically a fundamental part of the framework. I, in fact, have a full video on the top 10 annotations you need to know in Spring over here. But some developers are annotation crazy. They just slap unnecessary annotations on everything in sight. Let's take a look at this example. Let's say I have a util class called dateutils. Do you see anything wrong with this? This is a stateless utility class with a static helper method. Now, why does this need an add component annotation? There's really no need to create an instance of this class and put it in the bean registry, which is what the add component is doing here, right? The thing is, Spring is very good at showing an error when you forget to make a class a Spring bean, but there's no error or penalty for making a class a bean where it doesn't need to be, right? The root cause is developers not fully grasping the use case of these annotations, right? The add component is meant for classes with behavior that's necessary for dependency injection. So a random mutual class like this with static methods just don't fit the bill. So while annotations like the add component, the add service, and the add repository are useful for dependency injection, just overusing them can cause a lot of maintainability issues. Consider this other example. Now what's wrong here? In this case, the rest controller annotation already implies a response body. So explicitly adding the response body is redundant. So Spring MVC has several of such annotation hierarchies in this parent-child pairs, the child annotation implicitly inherits the behavior of the parent. So explicitly adding both the annotations clutters the code and it shows kind of like lack of understanding of that hierarchical relationship. Now, take a look at this other example. Is there annotation overuse over here? Well, I wouldn't call it annotation overuse because there are only two annotations in this simplified example. But what if I told you that you could actually get rid of one of these annotations? Yeah, you can avoid the auto-wired annotation by using constructor injection. Yes, if you were to switch this to a constructor, Spring automatically does constructor injection when it finds constructors with arguments and it happens to have Spring beans of the same types as what you have in the argument, right? So while at auto-wired is not technically overused here, it is really unnecessary thanks to constructor injection being available. So be careful and use Spring annotations carefully. Treat their usage as carefully as you do business logic code. Right? This can make a huge difference. Moving on to common mistake number two, inefficient management of application properties. So Spring Boot offers very powerful ways to externalize configuration and manage properties for different environments. But often I see developers misusing property files or not using the available features well, right? For example, I've seen a lot of data hard-coded where they actually should be externalized. There's a huge difference between a configuration being in your Java class, hard-coded in your Java class, and coded in your property files, even if they're both in the same jar file. Because Spring property file support is actually layered. You can override what's in your property file in a whole lot of ways by passing in command line flags or setting environment variables, all without touching the jar file that contains those property files. The right approach for any config values is to use Spring Boot support for externalized application properties. You can have values stored in application properties or application YAML files. So always favor externalizing configuration over hard coding or even doing custom config setup. This allows you to modify the value of those properties without changing your code. Properties can also be injected securely into beans like this, 
using the at value annotation, right? Here, the value of db.url property is being injected into the dburl field of whatever Spring Bean this code belongs to, right? So take advantage of Spring Boot's configuration management features. Here's another mistake. What's wrong with this code? What's happening here? There are two properties for db.url, right? This is tracking the URL for the database. There is a separate URL for dev and a separate URL for prod. And the way they've coded this in this property file is they have two separate properties one for each URL. Okay, will this work? Yes, of course it will work. The spring bean that needs the database URL can wire in both those values and depending on the environment, it detects the environment, whether is it in dev or is it in prod, and depending on the environment, it picks the right value. This is possible and it'll work, but there is a better way. This kind of environment specific values can leverage the profiles feature of spring properties. The ideal approach is to define some common application properties in the application.properties file and then override the environment specific values using profiles. So for example, you can say spring data source URL to be this particular URL and you can have specialized override URLs depending on the environment, if it's dev or prod or whatever else, right? You can use the same name for these properties, but you put them in different files, one for each environment. Now, if you do this, you can wire in the value using the property name, the same property name, right? The spring profiles feature then allows these properties to be conditionally picked depending on the active profile, if it's dev or prod or test or whatever else, right? You can activate profiles via configs, system properties, or the spring profiles active environment variables, right? This gives you full control over environment specific properties and environment specific configuration without having to duplicate it, right? So remember to leverage profiles for handling multiple environments, right? Your configuration will be cleaner and you have portability across environments and just makes it easy overall. Next up is mistake number three, inadequate exception handling in Spring Boot. So when you're working in Spring Boot, it's very crucial to handle exceptions efficiently. Unfortunately, many new developers fall into this trap of inadequate exceptional handling. This manifests in various different ways. They use generic exceptions without offering much insight into what actually went wrong, or they just completely ignore exceptions, or they handle it in a way that does not provide any meaningful information to either the user or to the developers. Imagine the scenario where your Spring Boot application encounters, let's say, a database error, right? But all your user gets is a generic something went wrong message, and your server logs have a generic internal server error message, right? This can be frustrating. This lack of detailed feedback can be very frustrating for the users, and for developers, debugging is gonna be a real pain, right? Sometimes I've seen developers catch and log exceptions, but they don't rethrow the exceptions or handle them appropriately, right? This leads to hidden bugs, and you wouldn't know something went wrong because the exception was essentially swallowed. Okay, so how do you handle exceptions efficiently? There are a bunch of things you can do. First, use specific exceptions. Instead of relying on generic exceptions, create and use more specific ones. This approach makes it very clear about what went wrong. It helps easier debugging and just generally more informative error messages. But here's the bad example. Right? You're trying to catch an error and then exception is caught and then you throw a runtime exception. Here's how I would change it. I would pick a more specialized exception, or maybe create my own custom exception and throw that instead. I can say, I'm gonna catch a data access exception and I'm going to throw my custom database operation exception instead, right? This provides clarity about the nature of the error, right? Custom exceptions allow you to kind of encapsulate specific error conditions and provide more context about the issue. The second thing you can do is global exception handling with the at controller advice annotation. So Spring Boot offers at controller advice or rest controller advice for rest controllers. This provides global exception handling. This allows you to handle exceptions across the whole application in a centralized manner. So for example, let's say I have this class which is annotated with at controller advice. Here, the at exception handler annotation is used to define a specific method that handles specific types of exceptions across the board, no matter where it happens, right? This works great in conjunction with the custom exceptions that I talked about. Create a custom exception and catch that custom exception in a global way, 
right? This ensures that whenever there is the database operation exception that we talked about, if it's thrown anywhere in the application, it's handled by this method and it returns a meaningful response to the user, right? You typically create dedicated method handlers for each type of exception in your controller advice classes, by the way. This ensures that each exception is handled in a way that's most appropriate for that specific error. Now, if you want to try and create a single controller advice class to handle the exceptions globally, you can do that for small projects, but in larger applications, it might be beneficial to have a few kind of domain specific controller advice classes, right? Each controller advice class handles things that could potentially go wrong for that domain. This keeps your exception handling more organized and focused rather than put all exception handling into one class. Moving on to the next item, the next mistake that I've seen people make. Logging. Logging is important enough that anyone writing a production application should know that it needs to be done. It's indispensable and it's crucial in Spring Boot applications as well, of course. Often developers, especially those new to Spring Boot, make some key mistakes in logging. Sometimes they do insufficient logging, which leaves you clueless about where the error occurs. Sometimes they do excessive logging, which can clutter up the logs and degrade performance. Imagine you're trying to diagnose an error, an issue without sufficient information that's logged, right? The issue has already happened and all the data that you have to figure out is whatever little you have put in the logs, everything else is gone, right? At best, you can add more logging and hope for that issue to reappear again. But what happened before? It's all disappeared, right? And conversely, excessive logging, especially at high levels of debug and trace, for routine operations can lead to kind of like this deluge of log data. It makes it very hard to spot the actual issues. And not to mention, there might be inappropriate logging, like logging sensitive information, PIIs, right, that can pose security risks, which is another huge can of worms. So what do you do? What are the logging practices that you need to follow so that you can avoid these common logging mistakes? Well, here are a few. First of all, understand and use log levels appropriately. Spring Boot supports various log levels, like you have error, warn, info, debug, and trace. Make sure you use the right level when you log messages in your code. Every time you log a message, you need to make that decision. What is the log level that you need to log this message in? So for example, error should be used for serious issues that need immediate attention warn for unexpected issues that are not necessarily errors, but they still need to be logged. Info for like operational messages that describe kind of step-by-step -step logistics of what the application is doing. Debug and trace are more verbose and they're suited for development and troubleshooting. Right? This is the first thing, log levels. Secondly, configuring logs for different environments, right? Spring Boot allows for easy management of log configuration in application.properties or application.yaml. Remember profiles for properties that we just talked about? Make sure you set the right levels for the right environments. Sure, you can use debug and info in dev environments, but you should probably not use that when you want to do log levels in production, right? Use Spring profiles to set up production log levels differently from the other environments, right? You can specify log levels. Actually, you can do this in various packages or classes to provide more control over what gets logged. So here's an example configuration. So I can say for the first package, which is logging level org spring framework web, log level is error. But when I'm doing logging for anything inside logging level com my app, the logging level needs to be info. Right? In this example, Spring's web framework is set to log only error messages, while your application, this is the second package, logs at info level. Right? You can customize those levels and use them wisely. The third thing that you need to do in terms of log levels is to write effective log messages. Right? Log messages should be clear and should provide enough context. Include relevant information like the user IDs or transaction IDs, but avoid logging sensitive data. Right? So effective logging in Spring Boot is very much a balance. You need to try and log the right amount of information at the right time. It's not just about recording everything that happens in your application, but it's more about making those logs actionable, informative, and at the same time making it secure. By understanding these log levels and configuring these log levels appropriately, you can write meaningful log messages and understand what's happening when you read those log messages, right? You can make your logs really useful and efficient and avoid this common mistake. 
with logging. And uh, there you have it, folks, a journey through the common pitfalls of Spring Boot development and how to kind of steer clear of them. Remember, every mistake is an opportunity to learn and grow. And by looking at mistakes that other people have made, we can fast track our learning, right? So I hope you learned from these mistakes, which I have made myself and have seen other people make as well. Have you made any Spring Boot mistakes or pitfalls of your own? Share them in the comments below. I'd love to hear about your experiences. And also, check out this video.